These men need a miracle. Let's trust God for their miracle right now. Jesus in your name. Jesus in your name. Touch Brother Jeffrey right now, God. Touch Brother Jeffrey right now in Jesus' name. Have your way, Lord.
quiet. My God is alive. I will continually have a praise in my mouth. Hallelujah. 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 Let me share a little bit of something with you real quick here. I've been going over and I've spent time with our dear brother Chris and sister Cindy that are probably watching that right now. And there was a portion of that song that said something about being breath. Thank you, in our, as long as I have breath, I'm going to praise the Lord. Yes, amen. Well, for those of you who don't know, our brother Chris, you need to pray for his breathing. He's struggling with his breathing. Pray that God will breathe into his lungs amen. and give him oxygen yes. from the heaven above. Hallelujah. But even though he is struggling, if you're around him very long, you see his hands yes. start to come up start to tremble as long as breath is in his lungs he's going to praise the Lord how much more should we praise him today while we have breath in our lungs hallelujah I praise you Jesus I praise you Lord continue to pray for him continue to believe brother uh, prayer for brother Bosky our two men need miracles let's pray for him in Jesus name but right now, we're talking about praising the Lord. We're going to give everybody a chance to praise the Lord. We're going to ask you to come down, put in your tithe and your offerings, and be a blessing to God. Amen? You can't outgive the Lord. If you're young and you haven't experienced that yet, you're going to. You cannot outgive the Lord. Pastor talked about it earlier how he put in whatever he had in his wallet. Before the service was over, it was already replenished. <laughs> you cannot give the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's pray for our offering. Lord, we love you, Jesus. We thank you for each and every one that's here, God. We thank you for your wonderful presence. And God, yes, we have come to praise you. And right now, Lord, we're going to praise you in our offerings and in our tithe. And we pray, God, that you'll take it, you'll sanctify it, you'll bless it to your kingdom, God. Do with it what you can do, Lord, because you can do all things. All things you can do, Lord. Bless it in Jesus' name. Amen.
amen, 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 amen. Amen, amen. Man, I enjoy this. This feels good in the house today. Oh, amen. Amen. Why don't you uh, turn around and shake hands with somebody you haven't met yet today? Man, we're going to be moving into the word of the Lord here in just a moment. all of our guests, we want to say thank you for choosing to join us today. It's a choice. Amen. We thank you. We are, we are honored. We are honored that you chose this place to worship in today. Thank you. Amen. Going to be turning into the Word of God, Genesis, the third chapter, and I'm going to read just a couple verses here and uh, hopefully make sense a little later tie it all together Amen. Genesis 3 and 24 and so he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life dropping down to Matthew, uh, third chapter, 27th chapter, I'm sorry, third verse. And Judas, when he had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned and I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to it. Amen. We're just going to hold off right there. We'll, we'll get into the next verses later. Lord, I pray, God, that you would touch today, that you would speak to our hearts and our minds, and that you would direct us. And I give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated today. You know, we are, we are all familiar with the events that transpired in the book of Genesis, most everyone has read at least part of the Bible. And, and you know, figure it out. You know, we all start at the beginning, Genesis. And we start reading through and we find out how God created all of the things. And then he, he created this garden and he created man. And he put him in the garden. And uh, Adam is in the garden. He's, he's taking care of it. Don't ever think that God didn't make man to work because God put Adam in the garden to keep it and care for it. He didn't say go there and be lazy. He didn't say go there and sit under the palm trees and, you know, enjoy the breeze. Keep it and take care of it. And so Adam did, and Adam is naming all of the animals, and he's, he's, he's figuring out what to call them. Can you imagine that? I mean, hippopotamus. How did he come up with a name like that? Really? I mean, and then, and then, then it was fly. Well, duh. Okay, so if you're going to call a fly a fly because he flies, why did you call a hippopotamus a hippopotamus? We'll leave that for later. Just, so Adam is going through all of this, and he's, he's naming the animals, and, and there's no help me found for Adam. So Adam is put into a deep sleep and God takes from his rib, from his side, he takes, uh, takes a rib from his side and he creates the woman. Now there's been all kinds of things said about that, how that, you know, he did not, he, he took it from his side so that she could walk beside him. She does not belong behind, behind him. She does not belong in front but he took from his side. And so he creates this help meet for Adam. And I, you know, we always look at uh, the male and female, the household, and, you know, you say, oh, man is head of the house. Look at that, man's head of the house. And all the guys love that. He's head of the house, okay. You know, they love that part. Let me tell you that the lady is the heart of the house. And without a heart, 
ahead is cold and it's unemotional. And without a head, the heart is flighty. But God designed male and female and you put them together and he gives leadership and she gives tenderness and and direction and and so they work together as a team and and Adam and Eve are in the garden this couple the first couple ever are in the garden just think guys Adam never had to hurt here were you looking at that other girl They're in the garden. And you know, it's a wonderful place. The garden was a place of paradise. But of course, along comes Satan. And he begins to tempt Eve. And I find it very interesting. He, he comes to her and he says, Has God not said? And he goes right to get her to question the word of God. Has God not said? You can eat of every tree of the garden. And Eve, now I don't know. I don't know if Adam emphasized this. I don't know if Eve thought, hey, I'm just going to give it a little extra punch or what. But she said, oh, no, we cannot eat nor touch of this tree that is in the midst of the garden. Now, can't can't you picture this? Can't you picture Satan walking over to the tree and going, oh, really? Can't touch it, huh? Okay. He doesn't have to say a whole lot more. And I don't know if it was weeks or days. I don't know how long it took that Eve is watching Satan. He hasn't died yet. He hasn't fallen over yet. God, did you make a mistake? Did you did 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 we hear you wrong? Is something, what's going on? And so she saw that the tree was good. And so she took of it and gave it to Adam. And of course, we all know that their eyes are opened and they then make skins or they cover themselves with leaves. And God comes walking to fellowship with them. He didn't come walking to punish them. We always remember that condemnation comes from the devil. Conviction comes from God. And so God comes walking in the cool of the day. He wants to fellowship with them. And they hide themselves. And so it comes out. It's all explained that the the woman took of the tree and she gave it to Adam. And and Satan had beguiled her. She was deceived. And God has to deal with sin. It is not, he, he cannot in his nature allow sin to go undealt with. And I know we're all looking around saying, but God, would you just deal with some of this stuff that's going on in our world today? Would you just take care of it? But there is a day coming, we know, and God is faithful and is true. Because the Bible even tells us that there are people that are going to say, oh, look, it's been so long and he's not here. You say God's coming back? But look how long it's been. But God is not unfaithful. God is faithful in his promises and he has promised to return and to judge this world. And so God deals with Adam and Eve and they are kicked out of the garden. And now they're on the outside. They're looking. They're driven away. There's an angel. God said, you know, lest lest Adam and Eve take and partake of the tree of life and live forever, In this sinful state, God showing mercy said, I can't let them eat of the tree of life because they will forever be in this sinful state. And so God, God, excuse me, God places a cherubim with a flaming sword that guards the tree of life. And Adam and Eve are on the outside of the garden. But you know, eventually they have two sons. But in the middle of all of this pronouncement, God said in Genesis 3 and 15, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, speaking to Satan, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And God is speaking of the coming Messiah, 
There is hope. There is a plan already in place. It's already that God says, I'm going to send a Messiah. I'm going to take care of this situation. But Adam and Eve are on the outside now, and so they, they have two sons, and we hear of the sons giving sacrifices. Now, why did they do that? Where did they get that idea? It had to be from mom and dad. Mom and dad, it's important to come to church. It had to be from mom and dad. And so the boys grew up and they watched. And I can see it now. I can see Adam and Eve and they went back to where they could see that flaming sword. So why do you say that? The Bible doesn't say that. No, but people don't change. People stay the same throughout millennium and generations and generations. That's why people call you when they're sick. Because they know you go to a place where they felt the presence of God. People that leave the church, people that slide away from God, always know in the back of their mind there is a place where God meets people. And when I have a problem, I'm going to call those folks. I'm getting back to that place because I know the presence of God is there. And so Adam and Eve would go back to that place and they would look. There it is. Flaming sword, it's still still burning, it's still there. And so I can see Adam as he would take the sacrifice and say, watch Eve, you keep an eye on that sword. That thing goes out, we're running in. We're getting in there, all right? You keep a close eye on it, Eve. I'm gonna do the sacrifice. And, and, and Eve would watch and Adam would perform the sacrifice. And how's it, how's it looking, Eve? How's it looking? No, it's still there, Adam. It's still there, keep going. And, and finally, he said, that's it. Sword still, still blazing, still there. We can't get in. And dejected, they would turn around and walk away. And in their mind, they're thinking, this is just not the way it's supposed to be. This is not how it's supposed to be. Boys grew up, and I'm sure Eve remembered the words that God said about this, her seed, Enmity, seed of the serpent. So Abel made his sacrifices as they always did. And Cain did something different. Can you see Eve kind of watching? Well, maybe he maybe, maybe this is what God was talking about. Maybe this is we've never tried this before. He's bringing of the fruit of the ground. We're gonna watch. And so she watches the sword, and Cain presents his sacrifice and the sword is still blazing, and they walk away again, dejected. This is not the way it's supposed to be. So we find out, even a little later, not too long, and Eve hears of Abel being, Abel being slain in the field. And she's shaking her head. This is, not, this is not the way it's supposed to be. This is not the way life is supposed to go. Years later, we're finding the Bible, this great, great event, and Jesus Christ is born in Bethlehem. We find that the wise men came, the shepherds came, and all of this happened. And the Bible says that he, when he, he grew, as age 30, he came into his ministry. And did, you know what I find amazing? I was, I was watching, and yeah, okay, I get kind of nerdy in some of the stuff I, I, I pay attention to, but I was watching a lecture on the frontal cortex. And the frontal cortex is where your logic is. And it's, it, it's, it's, where, you, it's where you determine right from wrong, and your will is contained in the frontal cortex. And so if a child grows up, in a home with a lot of abuse or a lot of, it, it's, it's a hard uh, type and it doesn't have to be physical, it could be verbal abuse, so on and so forth. The frontal cortex is measurably smaller. And what, the, what happens is their logic is not as developed. Their will is not as developed, but their emotions from the rest of the brain goes rampant. And so they're emotionally responding to this and emotionally responding to that instead of stepping back, pause and plan. 
When something happens, pause and plan. And so instead of doing that, they, they, they respond emotionally because this, this part of their brain is undeveloped. And the, the, the person giving the lecture said, and it doesn't completely develop until 30 years of age. Wow. Jesus began his ministry 30 years of age. It was in the Jewish customs that a man could not be a rabbi until he turned 30. How did they know? I don't know. But I find it so interesting that God puts everything, everything fits together. Everything works right. Everything happens for a reason. And everything comes together the way it's supposed to. And the Bible says that Jesus who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. He's doing great. He's ministering. He's bringing the word of God to people, telling them the kingdom of God is at hand. And finally, we come across this situation. I can hear Judas screaming, I believed him. I believed it when he said he'd have a kingdom. I believed him. He was just moving too slow. I only came to you guys so you'd push him a little. I figure when you go to arrest him, he's going to show off his power. And instead of him being hung on a cross, we're going to be sitting in the palace the next day. I believed him. Now I've sinned. And he throws the 30 pieces of silver down at their feet. They're like, meh, not our problem. Take care of that however you want to. It's not supposed to be that way. He wasn't supposed to die. Judas had it all figured out. That Jesus was the Messiah and he was going to come in a political, political kingdom. And all he had to do was give a little push to the dominoes. And watch them all fall down and how that Jesus was going to rise up. And of course, Judas was going to be sitting as a treasurer by him. You know, God's ways are not our ways. His ways are high above our ways, as high as the heavens are above the earth. And so Judas, Judas is thinking it's not supposed to be that way. It's just not supposed to happen like this. I was reminded of that even last night, talking to a friend, and they were talking about the road to Emmaus. And the two disciples, and they're walking along, and they're not, they're not sure. They don't understand. They're confused. Luke 24, 19, and he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which is a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, how the chief peace... And the rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. Besides all of that, it's been three days. We don't understand what's going on. We can't figure out what's going on and why it happened like this. And I know there are times in your life and there are times in my life that I have wondered and said, God, it's not supposed to be like this. It's not supposed to be this way. Forgive the personal reference. A few years ago, my wife and I talked about, oh, one of these days, one of these days, you know, we're going to, you know, the kids are all going to move out and, and we're going to just retire and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And we had all of these plans. And as many of you know, she passed away a few years ago. And I'm thinking, God, it's not supposed to be like this. It's not supposed to happen this way. It's not supposed to go like this. Because in my mind, 
I had ideas. In my mind, I had thoughts. But God's ways are above our ways. And it doesn't matter if it seems like uh, it, everything is falling apart uh, because God is working in the background and he's putting things together. And we can walk along and say, it's not supposed to be like this. Uh, but God says, trust me, trust me, trust me. We walk this life uh, and we don't understand everything. You may not understand what's going on in your life. You may not be able to figure out why. And of course, we as humans, and we go back and try to think things through. It's like, what happened? What could I have done different? Why does it go like this? And God is busy moving things around for our benefit. The disciples are walking along and they're, we're confused, God. We trusted in him. I went to church. I gave my heart to the Lord. And now, I don't understand what's going on. God, did I get it wrong? Did I misunderstand something? God, I, I, I did all the stuff. You know, I gave in the offering. Why am I hurting financially? I pray. Why do I feel so empty? I read my Bible. Why do I feel so lost? I, I've done this and I've done that. God, I don't understand. I've trusted in you. I've believed in you. I have believed what your word said. And yet here I stand today and I'm wondering what in the world is going on and why is things like they are. And I'm telling you again, we don't always understand God's ways, but we can always trust his heart. You may not be able to see his hand. You may not be able to figure out uh, what's going to happen next. Uh, you may not be able to know uh, what's going to come your way. But you can trust uh, that you serve a God uh, that loves you. A God that cares more than anything else. Uh, a God that will lift you up uh, and touch you in the right time. Oh, come on. Let's clap our hands and give praise unto the Lord. We can trust in God. And we walk around thinking, oh, it's not supposed to be like this. It's not supposed to be like this. Eve, Adam, you didn't understand. God had a purpose in that flaming sword. Sometimes the things we want most, God says, nope. Sometimes the things we, we desire, God says, not yet, not yet. I can't let you into this garden yet, but there's coming a day. There is coming a day. And we read and we hear about Jesus Christ uh, and how they took and they scourged him and they beat him. And you know, let me tell you something. He did not get 39 stripes. That was a Jewish law. He might have got that from Pilate or something when he scourged him. But the Romans had a whole different outlook on things. The Romans had a game they played. And now think about this. You're a Roman soldier. Your job is to stay with this guy till he passes away on the cross. Well, I don't want to hang out there on that hill all that long. What can I do to speed things up? And so the Romans had a game they played. They would beat until their arm got just too tired. They couldn't do it. And then they'd hand the whip to the next guy. And the whip was a cat of nine tails with glass and rock in the end of it. So it was sharp and, and it would tear. And the game they would play was who could hook a rib. The thought was if I can get this thing to come and wrap around and hook a rib and yank back, I can pop a rib out while he's still alive. 
And so that was their game, and they would beat and beat until one got tired. He'd hand it off to the next one. He would get tired, hand it off to the next guy, and on and on it went. And the Bible tells us his vicious was, vestige was so marred that he was not even recognizable. And so he's beat, and he's placed on the cross, and he's hanging there. And the cross, uh, the way they did that, when they drove the nail in, it severed a tendon, and it forced him to push on his feet. He could not pull up with his arms. It forced him to push on his feet to try to exhale. Oh, you can inhale. You can inhale with your arms spread out, but you can't push out. And so here you are with lungs full of air and they're burning. You ever been underwater? You've done that. You know, as a kid, you've gone underwater and you hold your breath and you're trying to see how long and if the lungs start burning and all this. And this is what Jesus faced for hours and hours. And finally, he would push on that nail that was holding his feet and shove his raw back up a rough piece of wood and let out the air. And on it went. And I'm sure Mary is saying, God, I know you talked to me. I know you gave me this boy. God, I know. I know that wise men came and they spoke great things. And and, and that gold, the frankincense, the myrrh. God, I know I heard it right. It's just not supposed to be this way. And finally, finally he gave his last breath. And the soldier came with the spear. And what they would do normally is they would break the legs because the legs are what pushed you up. And so they broke the legs on the thieves so they would suffocate with lungs full of air. And the soldier came with a spear And he stabbed it in his side. And from his side, the Bible says, flowed blood and water. And the blood and the water that flowed from his side put out the flaming sword. It put out the restrictions. God said, I can't let you back in the garden today. I can't let you in here right now because I've got a plan and it's coming. And and that, that blood and water is going to extinguish the sword. And now, now we have access to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now today, we can bring our problems. We can bring the issues to the King of Kings and know that he hears us. Come on, let's all stand across this place. Oh, we have access. That sword has been put out through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't know what we're all facing here today. But I know that in every life, There comes times when we just look around. I worked a certain job for 30 years. And I remember sometimes driving in thinking, oh, Lord, I don't want to work this. I don't want to go in this place. I did not like it. I did not like the place. And in the right time, things happen. I'm no longer there. But we all face that. We all look around and say, you know, it's just not supposed to be like this. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your walk with God. Maybe it's the fact that you need to give your life to God. Because I promise you, once you do, you may not understand it, but you'll always have him with you. But we all walk through life and we look around thinking, it's just not supposed to be like this. I, I, I thought it was going to be different. I thought things were going to change. I thought this loved one was going to stay and be with me. I thought that one was going to do something else and yet 
didn't happen that way. And so we stand here thinking, God, it's not supposed to be like this. So I'm going to invite anyone and everyone to come forward today because we serve a God. We serve a God that no matter how it looks, Adam and Eve stood outside the garden and they looked at that flaming sword and they said, God, it's just not supposed to be like this. And God said, I got a plan. I got a plan. You don't know it. You don't understand. But I have a plan. I have a plan that's going to go way beyond that flaming sword being put out. You might have sacrificed and that sword went out. You'd have ran in the garden. And the plan of salvation would not have been fulfilled. God's ways above our ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth. So today, whether you're questioning what's going on in your life or whether you just want to come forward and give honor to God and to pray for a while and give thanks and pray with someone else, We're going to go before the Lord in prayer right now. God, God, I give honor to you, Lord, and I thank you for your goodness. I thank you, Lord, when you walk us through the the valleys. I love the mountaintops, God, but I thank you for the valleys. We grow in the valleys, God. We get strength in the valleys, Lord. We celebrate on the mountaintops, God. But in the valley, you restore our souls. And God, I come before you today. I may not understand everything that's going on, and I may have different ideas, and I may have my wishes and my plans may be different. But God, I come here today once again to say I trust you. I trust you, Lord. I trust you with my life. I trust you, God, with my future. I trust you, God, with everything that I am, with everything I hope to be. I trust you with my successes. I trust you with my failures, God. I give myself to you, God, trusting you, trusting you, God. All over this place, let's just lift up our voice and give praise.
for his goodness today. We have a God that never fails us. We have a God that doesn't let us down. We get ideas. We think. We plan. We think we have it all figured out. And God says, wait a minute. I got a better plan. I got a better plan. If you're going through something today, if you're struggling, trying to figure out why and what all is going on, we can trust that God has a better plan. God has a better plan. I don't know what it all is all the time, and I don't understand it, but I know Him, and I trust Him. And because I trust Him, I can walk in confidence. I can walk saying, I know my God loves me. It may not look right right now, but He loves me. He cares for me. He's going to walk me through this valley. He's going to keep me through this time. God's going to move on this situation. I know it. I can trust Him. Amen. Amen. Let's give thanks unto the Lord for this message we have heard today. It has been so, so helpful, so beneficial. Come on, somebody, reach out to the Lord and just thank Him right now from the bottom of your heart, from the depths of your soul. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You can trust Him. You can believe. He's going to see you through. It's not over until he says it's over. He's working all things together for our good. Praise God. Thank you, Brother Fox, for that message today. How many wants to stick around about another five minutes and see somebody baptized in Jesus' name? We're going to baptize Felicia today. So Sister Cox, get some baptism singing going. If you have to be dismissed, we understand. God bless you. Amen. All of our guests. We will. I won't. I see. We do. I'll let you make that announcement while I'm going back there. But then you got to bring me a mic because I, I don't have much voice. All right. I might fall going up those stairs the way I am nowadays. I want to tell everybody. Has anybody ever read the book of Revelation? Yeah. Okay. Did you have a little bit of trouble understanding it? Well, starting the 16th of this month, which is not next Tuesday, but the Tuesday after, I'm going to go through the book of Revelation. Hopefully we'll be done in six weeks, just from seven to eight. But there are keys to understanding. You didn't understand because you couldn't have if you don't know the keys. The keys, John... You know, sometimes John goes forward, he'll stop, and he might back up, or he might just give you some information he wants you to know that might be happening at the same time as the last thing he said. So it gets confusing if you don't know the keys. So come and join me. It's very informal. Not this Tuesday, next Tuesday, the 16th, and I guarantee you, you'll learn much more than you ever thought you could get out of that book. Excuse me.
Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Thank you for sticking around to see this. You know what we're about to do here is the way they baptized in the Bible. They baptized by immersion. And whenever you see them in Scripture baptize somebody, they always use the name of Jesus. Now, it may be the name of Jesus Christ, the name of the Lord Jesus, but every place in the Scripture where they baptized somebody it was by immersion in the name of Jesus. And Sister Felicia H. saw that in a Bible study there at Bria not too many weeks ago, came and said, I want to get baptized like they got baptized in the Bible. Amen. Praise God. I'm not casting stones at anybody's baptism. I'm just saying if you're going to do it, might as well do it the Bible way. Hallelujah. And if you weren't baptized by immersion in the name of Jesus, maybe you had a family that that baptized you as a baby or, or maybe as a young person you got baptized and you would like to understand more about believer's baptism. Believer's baptism. We have material here for you about that. Amen. And it will be something that will bless your life. And I'm so thrilled. We love Sister Felicia around here. We are so thankful for Sister Shirley Minius and Sister Janice Sanders and the Adams and all that go out and minister in our community, taking the gospel to Bria. And I want Sister Janice to, say, uh, to pray a special prayer blessing. You'll have to grab one of these mics. I hope their praise mics are still on. They can get one going for you there. Is it on? That's on. Is it on? That's on. I could do it without it, you know. Lord, I just want to thank you again for sending another person into our lives, Jesus. We, we want to see her baptized in the only saving name out there, which is yours. Mighty name of Jesus. Felicia is a godly woman. She loves you, Lord. She knows her scripture, and she just wants to receive every gift you have from her, Lord. She wants to serve you as long as she has breath in her body. In your mighty name, Jesus, we thank you, and we praise your holy name. Amen. Amen. Sister Felicia H., upon the confession of your faith, your repentance and obedience to the word of God, I now baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and celebrate all that he is doing and will do in your life. Shake hands, be friendly, all of our guests, God bless you. 
We're thankful we'll see you in the house of the Lord Thursday night at 7 o'clock. Remember these announcements as you go.